Welcome to the Picademia course on the basics of semiconductors. This lecture covers thyristors. Let's start. By the time you finish this lesson, you will learn thyristor structure, forward blocking mode, reverse blocking mode, breakover voltage, breakdown voltage, and the thyristor gate behavior. So far, we have built up a good background knowledge about the rectifying diode. A diode allows the current to flow in one direction, but blocks it in the other direction. In other words, the diode is an uncontrolled device. Its current conductivity primarily depends on the current direction. So is there any other device that behaves similar to a diode, but its turn on time can be adjusted when biased forwardly? Surprisingly, there is a device and that is called thyristor. In early publications, the acronym SCR that stands for silicon controlled rectifier was used for a thyristor. So if you somewhere heard about SCR, do not think of a new device. SCRs and thyristors are all the same. Thyristors have been around since 1950s and these days are used in low switching frequency and high voltage of power applications. The technology to you to build a thyristor is not that advanced and it can be fabricated with not very fine structures. As a result, they are relatively not costly. Thyristors uh, are mostly used for rectifying the grid voltage where the base frequency is 50 Hertz or 60 Hertz or in applications that the power range of other devices cannot reach to what a thyristor can bring on the table. To bring the power rating of a thyristor into perspective, just imagine that the thyristor can have a blocking voltage of 8 kV and a current rating of 5.6 kA. A thyristor is made of four semiconductor layers, a P layer, N minus layer, P layer, and N plus layer. As a result, it has three junctions, J1, J2, and J3. Each one of these junctions are PN junctions, and therefore, we can model them with series diodes. The bottom end of the device is called anode, and the upper end is called cathode. If I connect a voltage source with its positive connected to anode and negative to cathode, the junctions J1 and J3 are forward biased and J2 is reverse biased. As a result, no current will flow through the device. Under these conditions, the internal electric field of the device looks like this. Around the junction J2, there is a triangular electric field that blocks the current flow. Now, what if I reverse the voltage source polarity? Does this device conduct electricity at all? Let's examine this situation. Under this condition, the junctions J1 and J3 are reverse bias and J2 is forward bias. Here we can see that the current flow is now blocked by J1 and J3. The electric field diagram associated with this biasing is plotted here. Since one side of the junction J3 is the N plus region, the depletion region of J3 becomes narrower. The junction J1 is made of a P semiconductor and, and uh, N minus uh, semiconductor. Therefore, the depletion region here is much bigger than that of J3. This is why the electric field waveforms are different for J3 and J1. So far, it looks like that this device does not conduct electricity no matter how biased. Don't get it disappointed. You need to be more patient since uh, this is not the end of the story. To gain a better understanding about the behavior of the device, let's take a look at its IV diagram. First, let's imagine this device is reverse biased. So according to the way the voltage source is connected to the device, VD is negative. By increasing VD negatively, a very small saturation current flows through the device. While increasing VD negatively, we finally get to the reverse breakdown voltage, VRBD. 
at which the current sky rockets. Under this condition, if the current is not limited by uh, a resistor, for example, the device will permanently get damaged. Clearly, the circuit containing such a device must be designed in a way that never the reverse breakdown voltage is met. In fact, the maximum reverse voltage that the device can continuously tolerate is VRRM. VRRM is determined based on the maximum power the device can tolerate. To put this into uh, perspective, imagine the maximum power this device can tolerate is 100 watts and the reverse saturation current is 50 milliampere. As a result, VRRM, uh, VRRM of this device is 2 kilovolts. The reverse breakdown voltage can be larger than 2 kilovolts. Let's now apply a positive voltage to the device and increase it gradually. The device is now in the forward blocking mode and only some forward leakage current passes through the device. This leakage current is due to the minority charge carriers. By increasing the forward voltage, the majority charge carriers holds in the semiconductor connected to the anode electrode are rippled from the ohmic terminal. In other words, they are pushed toward the junction J1. I hope you remember the discussion on the diode forward biasing, and if you, you don't, I highly recommend you to go back to the previous lectures and then come back to this video. Because whatever is happening at the junction J1 and J2 is the same as what uh, happens to a forward bias diode. I was saying that due to the positive voltage applied to anode, holes are rippled from the anode electrode and they are pushed toward the N- semiconductor. The larger the positive VD, the more holes diffuse into N- semiconductor. The majority charge carriers in the N- semiconductor are electrons. When the holes land in the N- semiconductor, the free electrons and holes recombine. If the forward voltage gets larger, more holes enter the N- semiconductor and more free electrons recombine with them. If this forward voltage increasing continues, we get to a point at which most of the free electrons in the N- semiconductor are uh, recombined by the holes and at the same time more holes are diffused into the N- semiconductor. Therefore, the holes now outnumber the free electrons in the N- semiconductor and the N- semiconductor is inverted to a p-type semiconductor. This process is called inversion. On the top end of the device pretty much the same process is taking place. By increasing VD more negative uh, potential energy is applied to the cathode electrode and more free electrons from the N plus uh, semiconductor are rippled. These electrons diffuse into the p-semiconductor through the junction J3 and recombine with the holes. Note that the majority charge carriers in the p-semiconductor are holes. If VD is large enough, the electrons outnumber the holes in the p-type semiconductor, and after the generation process, a handful of electrons remain. As a result, the P-type semiconductor is inverted into an N-type semiconductor. Now, what you can see is a bigger P-type semiconductor in the bottom and a bigger N-type semiconductor on the top. As you can see, this is nothing but a diode. Once this happens, the voltage over the device drops significantly and it becomes equal to a built-in voltage of around 1 volt. Let's see how this behavior is translated in the IV diagram. In the forward blocking mode, by increasing VD from zero, a small forward leakage current flows through the device. Similar to the reverse blocking mode, in the forward blocking mode, a maximum voltage called VDRM is defined based on the maximum power the device can tolerate. Again, imagine that the maximum power the device can tolerate is 100 watts and the forward leakage current is 50 milliampere. Therefore, 
VDRM is 2 kV. Through gradually increasing VD, it surpasses VDRM and still the forward leakage current flows through the device. But once VD equals the breakover voltage VBO, the inversion process, as I discussed earlier, happens and the device turns on and the voltage gets very small and the current skyrockets. In addition to the forward voltage condition, to turn on the device, there is one more condition that needs to be satisfied. Right after the device turns on, the current through the device must be larger than the latching current. As long as the current direction is forward, the device stays turned on. This device turns off only if the forward current gets smaller than the holding current, IH. The holding current is always smaller than the latching current. You may ask, what is the point to have such a device that requires a very large forward voltage to turn on? Is there any application for it? I agree with you in this regard, since we cannot find many applications for such a device. So, the question is, what can we do to turn on the device at a smaller forward voltage? To do so, I need to add an ohmic contact to the top piece of my conductor. I call this ohmic contact the gate. This device with the gate is called the thyristor or SCR. Even by properly biasing the gate under the reverse blocking mode, the thyristor does not conduct. Therefore, not too much of interest in discussing the reverse blocking mode when the gate is driven. Everything is the same as what I discussed earlier. If I forward bias the thyristor as shown here by using the gate, I can control the turn on time. Let's first imagine that VG is zero. Therefore, the IV diagram is similar to what we saw before. Now, if I increase VG, the gate ohmic contact becomes positively charged and it attracts free electrons from the N plus and N minus semiconductors. The larger VG becomes, the more free electrons are attracted to the P-semiconductor. If VG is big enough, free electrons outnumber the holes in the P-semiconductor, and therefore the top P-semiconductor is inverted to an N-type semiconductor. Therefore, the top three semiconductor layers collectively are now N-type. As a result, what remains is a P-N junction diode that can conduct current. Now let's uh, look at the IV diagram to see what difference we can find. A positive VG applied between the gate and cathode makes the J3 junction to be forward biased and therefore IG flows to the junction J3. A bigger IG can turn on the thyristor at a lower forward voltage. Unlike a BJT, once the thyristor turns on by the gate, there is no need to keep the gate driven. As long as the thyristor is forwardly biased and its current is more than the holding current, it remains in the on state. In this lecture, I discussed the thyristor structure, forward blocking mode, reverse blocking mode, breakover voltage, breakdown voltage, and thyristor gate behavior. In the next lecture, I'll cover the part two of the thyristor discussion. Thanks for joining this lecture of Picademia.